Today I want to show you in my talk the power and simplicity um, of um, SQL on top of Apache Flink. Um, and I also want to show you why and how you can actually leverage um, SQL for your use cases. So as we said, I am Timo Walter, um, working as a software engineer um, at Data Artisans and part of the Flink team since the ver very early beginnings. So quickly about uh, who is actually uh, Data Artisans. So Data Artisans is the company behind Apache Flink. We are still managing a lot of the contributions. We are also contributing still a lot um, into Apache Flink. We are, it was founded by the original creators of um, Apache Flink and our main product besides of services and training and so on and consulting is um, our D Data Artisans platform. So we want to commercialize Apache Flink and make it, um, yeah, make real time stream processing also enterprise ready, especially like things like security and, and other things that are mostly relevant to companies. So if you want to try out our platform, there is a download, a free tri trial version that you can um, use for trying Data Artisans platform. Um, Basically what Data Artisans platform is, is like it's, it's a possibility to manage your streaming infrastructure, especially if you are in the streaming space, it's very important that your applications and pipeline um, yeah, run 24 seven, if possible, or uh, yeah, that, that is the goal, goal at least. And yeah, Data Artisans platform makes, it, um, makes those um, streaming applications uh, manageable. So first of all, before I really di deep dive into um, into SQL on top of Flink. Um, let me first also explain what is actually Apache Flink because um, I mean, may, many people have heard of it but maybe not everyone is familiar with the, the basic concepts behind Apache Flink. So first of all, what are actually the core building blocks? So it doesn't matter if it is Apache Flink or not. What are the core building blocks for um, having a stream processing pipeline? So we um, identified four different things that a stream processor should be capable of. So first of all, I mean, we want to do stream processing, so we need data streams. Uh, we want to combine multiple streams. We want to um, do like ETL on multiple streams. We want to perform real-time computation on streams. We want to also be able to replay streams in case of failures. So maybe there is a message queue or some other stream storage system in front of the stream processor. Um, then usually you, you don't, do not only want to do the things like um, ETL processing, you also want to do like more complex stuff, so maybe you do some machine learning, so you need to store a machine learning algorithm in state. Um, you want to do, you want to save the last 10,000 records in state, so usually state is also a very important part of your, of your processing t um, pipeline. Um, when we talk about streaming, we also have to talk about time and especially about event time because when, when you work with streaming data, um, what you usually do is you have some, some time operations like windows you want to perform in a one hour window. Um, but when you do the, the, the actual computation, you maybe do not, you don't want to wait one hour until one hour is processed. Um, you want to do this quickly and this is possible by using uh, different notions of time like processing time in Flink and event time and this also helps you to deal with other problems related to stream processing such as out of order data and um, late data and also um, being able to replay streams based on these timestamps um, that Flink or other stream processors can handle. And the last and very, the most important part of every stream processing pipeline is what happens if I need to update my business logic, what happens if I need to upgrade the stream processor, um, or I just want to do some testing and trying out new stuff. What you actually want to do is you want to take a snapshot of your entire streaming topology. Um, you maybe want to fork off and uh, use this snapshot in a testing environment or staging cluster. Um, you want to do versioning, like trying out your bug fix before you go to production. Um, and also maybe you want to even do something like time traveling. So you take snapshots every week, every day, and then you can play around uh, with these snapshots. So if we look what is a, actually a stream processing architecture, 
um, we compare ourselves to the classical tiered architecture. So I think most of you know this already, like a classical tiered architecture is split up into usually two layers, like you have a compute layer, you have stateless servers, like web servers for example, and then you have a database layer where you, where you store your data and then you have to perform read and writes, this introduces latency, this in introduces throughput problems at some point, especially if you uh, want to scale out the compute layer, you always have to keep in mind how do I scale out actually my, my, um, my database layer as well. And in the streaming architecture, we couple the computation and the state uh, um, very close to each other, so the data and the state um, are next to each other, that means modifications are local and we can also scale out and scale in the computation and state um, at the same time. So if we want to, um, if I would like to, to uh, explain Apache Flink, this is my most um, favorite um, slide because it explains Apache Flink in just one animated diagram. So Apache Flink is basically how you would um, define a data flow on a whiteboard basically. So you have some operators like this bubbles here and then you have some arrows that indicate the data that is flowing through your system and then um, you would do some computation. You maybe want to store some events in state. Maybe you uh, wait for an end event, so you have to first store them and then uh, maybe you set a timer and say, okay, maybe um, if there is no end event arriving, maybe after one hour I will, I will I want to process this event again. And this is exactly what Apache Flink is doing. So whenever a computation uh, or an operator is done with its, with its computation, the results are immediately streamed to the next operator. You can store uh, events in state, you can retrieve them and you can also um, set uh, timers at any point in time and um, uh, react on those timers and this allows like more event driven applications. And the, the very specialty about Flink is uh, we can do entire snapshots uh, of the running application which is then stored on a persistent storage and then you can recover from failures or you can also perform cluster migration and so on with these uh, persistent snapshots. So to um, summarize um, what is Apache Flink? You can summarize it in, in one sentence, like having stateful computations over streams. This is useful both for both real time and historical data. Um, it's fast, it's scalable, it's fault toler tolerant. Flink has event time guarantees, can handle very large state in the orders of terabyte and more, and uh, very strong consistency guarantees. So um, we provide exactly once guarantee, so no um, duplicate or missing records. Um, through the architecture of using a stream processor, we can connect ourselves to different um, um, sources and things, like um, the, the data can come from applications, from devices, IoT, sensors, um, yeah, and you can process both um, real-time data streams and also historical data that is stored like in S3, for example. Um, after the Flink computation is done, we can then also dump our results into databases, into Kafka, into files, file systems, um, yeah, depends on your use cases. Um, if you look at the, the users of Flink, so these are the, what, just a selection of some big users we are, we know about. Um, um, Uber is using Apache Flink in their um, streaming platform, um, I think it's called Athena X. Um, they are also using a lot of uh, stream SQL um, to make it easier for their data scientists and so on to define pipelines and also for managing those pipelines in the future. Um, Netflix is also using Flink as you, as you can see in a, in a very large scale. The Alibaba group is one of our biggest um, users of Flink so they are running thousands of Flink jobs and at very, very large scale. So as you can see, yeah, 100,000 uh, cores and more. Um, but they are also providing um, Stream SQL um, as a platform. And ING, a traditional bank, is also using Flink for more for fraud detection of credit cards and uh, um, money transfers and so on. And yeah, the list is, is longer and longer. So as you can see, a lot of companies like Lyft, Airbnb, uh, Expedia, Huawei, they are all ready um, using Flink in production. 
So, but now let's take a, let's talk a little bit about Flink SQL because that's our um, actual topic of this talk. So, if you look at um, Flink's um, APIs, there we have we have different levels of abstractions. Um, so, the Data Stream API is our main API in Flink. It allows for both batch and stream processing. It has okayish um, abstraction. So, the Data Stream API provides some predefined operators like windows and dealing uh, with data streams in general. Um, you can use Scala, you can use Java for that if you like. But um, we also got the feedback that people actually want to have more low-level access to, to Flink. And that's why we came up with a process function. Process function is a function that gives you access to the primitives of, of Flink. Like the primitives are having access to events, having access to state, and also having access to Flink's timer services. So there you can really deal with setting a timer, um, providing a call back, what happens if the timer fires, and so on. And this um, enables you to build like real stateful event-driven applications. But we also saw people um, having problems with Java because not everyone is able to program Java or Scala. And we wanted to improve that. And that's why we put a SQL and table API on top of the data stream API. Um, by the way, you can mix and match all these uh, APIs together. So you can, for example, use SQL for doing some, some pre-processing or some, use some built-in functions. Then you can go to data stream or even to process function if you want to do more complex stuff that is not easily expressible um, um, by, by, by SQL. So whatever you um, want to use, there is an API that maybe helps you in dealing with, with the problem. Um, let's talk a little bit about Flink's, uh, Apache Flink's uh, relational APIs. Um, so as I already said, there is the SQL API. The SQL API is plain SQL, so a standard SQL. We are not using uh, some dialect of SQL and uh, Im yeah, implement our own clo um, SQL clauses. No, this is standard SQL. You can copy every SQL query and paste it also into a database and it should run. Um, next to SQL, we also provide a, a more programming-like API. So we are calling this the table API. Um, table API is useful, especially if you want to integrate uh, a SQL program into your into your bigger pipeline because it also helps like identifying problems like uh, the IDE helps you when you design um, a pipeline because certain operations are just not supported at certain points when you press the dot button or the dot key. Um, and you also get, um, I mean, you can open the methods, you get Java docs and so on that helps while you are developing a pipeline. So those two things doing exactly the same thing, but um, yeah, you can use either strings uh, in one plain SQL string or you do it in a more link style fashion. Um, a very, very important uh, thing is that we also try to both unify batch and streaming with those APIs. So it doesn't matter if you run both of those um, API queries on batch data or on streaming data. Our goal is that a query specifies exactly the same um, semantics and the same results for, um, for a given input. So how do we actually do that? So this is just a quick um, overview of the internals, how Flink's SQL API looks underneath. So as you can see on the left and on the right side, um, we have a, a table API and the SQL API. Both APIs have validation and parsing layers. Um, in the core of our API, we are using the Apache CalSite framework. Um, CalSite is uh, a Apache project specialized for doing like uh, relational optimization, relational um, planning and so on. Um, so we are relying a lot, of, uh, a lot on also on the Apache CalSite. Um, um, you as a user, you can register external tables, you can register data stream programs or data set programs in CalSite's catalog. And then 
we insert rules to compile your query down either into the batch part or in the streaming part. So the data set API is the batch part of Apache Flink if you have not know that. Um yeah because Flink is also a stream processor is also a very nice batch processor and um yeah you can um, run batch queries on Flink as well if the data is bounded and if the data is unbounded then we compile compile it into a data stream uh, program. So let me quickly um, explain how do we actually um, ensure that we have the same results for b both batch and streaming data. Um, so if you ha let's pretend we have a clicks file it, it, it contains some URL clicks from some users and we now want to just count the number of clicks per user. I mean if we are in a in a in a database or in a batch world what we usually do is we read the entire um the entire uh, the entire input at once we perform some calculation so we put it into our query in our um processor and at, in the end we emit the result so the input is read once and then the output is also produced uh, just once that's how the batch world works um how does it look like in the in the streaming case um so usually the records are coming in uh, row by row so what happens um is yeah at first our stream is empty our table is empty um then we would um insert a, a row we were internally uh, maintain some counter in st in flink state and then we would uh, emit like in this case a counter of 1 that's straightforward right um yeah then bob comes in also no problem we will emit a counter of bob um afterwards uh, but then we have a problem because Mary um is there a second time so what happens is we have to update our results so the result that we sent out like Mary is one becomes now Mary two so we have to deal with with changes like we are emitting change logs basically and need to update um the results in the outside world. Data is still uh is, is read continuously but the the output is updated also continuously. But as you can see the final result of both computations batch and streaming um is the same. So why is actually stream and batch unification so important? So first of all I already mentioned that we didn't want we did not want to provide some custom SQL syntax and we don't want to have stream specific results no we want to be as close or identical to um regular SQL uh, semantics. And this is also useful for portability because then you can um decide how you want to process your data with SQL. Like um in this case in this example shows um the data that is coming in into your into your company. Um I mean if you want to run a query on bounded uh, on bounded data this is very easy because you just cut the data that is coming in into chunks like a daily or nightly batch jobs that you execute. But the nice thing is in streaming you can decide when you when you want to execute your streaming query. So you can compute you can compute um results from the past but you can also start now and compute to the future ba basically so you can have running queries that start an at an arbitrary um um arbitrary position in time um and then you can use the query either for batch or for stream processing um for historical and um production real time uh, processing with the same semantics um actually this is not a very new feature because database systems were doing that for a very long time maybe some of you have heard of materialized views so what are materialized views like materialized views are a special case of views so you define your sql query in advance and then the database system maintains internally some table um by consuming the change log streams of of um the base table so usually a materialized view has no access to the base tables but it just um consumes the change log of those base tables and materialized views are usually used to speed up um the query time so that you don't have to have to calculate the query when it is executed for the first time or accessed for the first time so the database system already pre-computes uh, the results for you and th 
there you also have um, to have to deal with with change logs, and that's why, why it is very similar to how Apache Flink SQL works underneath. So our core concept in a Flink is what we call dynamic tables. Um, just to mention it, um, dynamic tables are just a concept. So whenever you hear like we're, when we are talking about tables in Flink, there is no table stored in memory or something. We only store in, in Flink state what is really necessary to maintain a query. So you define a SQL query and this query um, consumes data and emits data. And this is what a, a dynamic table does as well. So a dynamic table is not static, it's, it changes over time. Um, the result of a dynamic table is another dynamic table. So you can have subqueries accessing another table and so on. So you can have a very complex um, pipeline. And dynamic tables never, never terminate. So they are, yeah, in, like in stream processing, as long as the input is unbounded, also the result stream, the result output change log um, is unbounded. And then it comes a little bit, there's a little um, difficulty in how do you actually convert between a stream and a dynamic table. So the, there are basically three different kinds how you can convert a stream to a dynamic table and also how you can convert it uh, backwards. So we name these three types of conversion, append conversion, absurd conversion, and retract conversion. Which means append conversions means that the change log stream that, are, that is coming out um, of the dynamic table, if you want to say it like that, um, consists only of insertions. So this is a typical ETL use case where you just um, do some projection. So you maybe you want to filter out some field or you want to apply some, some simple functions like uh, timestamp conversion or something like that. Um, so every, every insertion is also an insertion in the result stream. But what happens if you have, have to update um, your results? Because like in this example, you want to count and this count increases and changes when new records are coming in. Um, so there are two types of conversion for, for changing um, um, the results. First of all, if there is a key defined, then it's, uh, that is nice because then we can use this unique key. I mean, it can also be a composite key if you want. Um, we can use this key for delegating it to some, to some system like um, please um, update this key for me or please delete this key for me. This could be, for example, if you want to store a dynamic table in Elasticsearch, then you would send some absurd and delete requests to Elasticsearch. Um, if the system or the query does not um, support or does not have a unique key attribute, then we provide another, another possibility which we call a retract conversions which means instead of sending an absurd message to the downstream system, um, we are basically first deleting the old record. So we are deleting the record with the old count and then we are sending out another record for um, inserting the new row with a new count. So every update is then first a deletion and then an insertion and with up, up to absurd conversions it would be just, just one um, absurd or delete. So these are the, the ways how you can convert streams and tables back and forth. So let me also talk a bit, lit, little bit about what we actually can do with Flink SQL. Um, so by, by the latest version, we have a lot of built-in operators um, like um, yeah, you can do a simple select from where queries, um, you can do group by, you can use having, um, for group by, we, we um, support both non-windowed and also windowed um, um, computations. So you can also define windows of one hour um, using a special um, or provided um, um, user-defined functions that uh, describe your window, like the tumble windows, hop windows, and session windows. Um, we provide different join implementations. You can do it um, non-windowed, like we know it from the from the SQL world. So you can use regular inner, left, outer, and full joins. Um, if you want to bound the state size, because um, for joins you never know if there is another matching record coming in. So what you usually want to do, you, you want to um, window the the computation a little bit. So. Um, 
um, what we provide is that we have inner joints, left joints, right and full outer joints also in a windowed fashion where you specify some, some time constraints in the wear clause basically. Um, for streaming, so, so all these operators are supported for both batch and streaming. Um, we also have um, streaming only operations uh, like the regular SQL over, over windows where you can um, look at the surrounding of a row like what are, so in your aggregation you include rows that were preceding or bounded preceding um, the, the, the current row. And um, we also support like batch only operations. Maybe they will also be uh, supported in, in, in streaming in the future, but for now they are batch only, like union, intersect, accept, and also order by. Um, especially for ETL and uh, little data pre processing, we have support for POJOs. So you can have uh, arbitrarily uh, nested data. We support also complex types like maps and arrays and other nested uh, types. We provide a large set of built-in functions like, yeah, like and extract timestamp functions and so on, uh, hashing functions. Um, yeah, this is, I mean, this is a continuous effort. Um, you cannot support all the functions because it's just too much, but we already provide, uh, provide 150 plus uh, functions and if there is a function missing for you, there is always a way of defining your custom UDFs either for aggregation functions, for table valued functions or for simple um, scholar functions. So there is also a point for extensibility and you can also find more about that in our documentation. Um, there is also a large set of upcoming um, SQL features like we want to improve um, the way we can join data especially for streaming so we're working on a streaming enrichment join where you have a, or also called temporal join um, where you can have a table that is continuously updating and then you just want to stream by some records like for example you have a, a currency table and the current, cu the current currency rate is updating from time to time and whenever a order streams by, you want to uh, have a view on this version table, how did the table look like at timestamp t, because this is the, so for example I'm using the, the, the timestamp of the order, I want to look up what was the current currency rate for euro to dollar currency conversion for example. Um, we also want to support um, complex event processing. Um, this is a very new addition to the standard. It's called match recognize. So we want to be able to define um, patterns and uh, enable to, um, to define patterns in streams uh, by using this clause. So we already provide a complex event processing library in Flink and this new match recognize clause allows us to connect the already existing CEP library with our SQL library and define everything in SQL um, if this is um, necessary. Um, yeah, and we're also trying to improve more on the connector and format side because there are so many connectors out there and yeah, people want to use Flink, the core is very good, but um, yeah, maybe the connectors need a little bit more love. So what can I actually build with all of that? I mean, I already mentioned um, ETL, so um, yeah, we can, you can define uh, complex data pipelines where you can transform things, you can aggregate things um, and move just the events in real time from system A to system B. You can do low latency ETL which means um, yeah, you can process the data as it comes in and directly store it in its final, final location. Um, how you prefer it, database system, key value stores, Cassandra, Elasticsearch and so on. Um, you can uh, perform stream and batch analytics, so you're defining, you define an analytical query, um, then you save the results in Elasticsearch and maybe you add Kibana on top of it and then you have your dashboard ready. Um, and there, so there are different possibilities to use a stream processor uh, for building um, arbitrary pipelines. Um, this all sounds great, but actually how can I really use it? So how, where do I define my SQL queries? Um, so I already mentioned that. Um, usually what most people do is they use the, so, so they define their SQL query, they embed it in some bigger pipeline that is developed in Java or Scala. 
And then they can also use other libraries like I mentioned CP and we also have a graph library. Um, yeah, so that you can also um, package and operate your query and your entire pipeline in a jar file and then you can submit it uh, to the Flink cluster. This is the, the regular uh, production ready um, way of using uh, Flink SQL or that uh, many people are using. But we are also working on a new type of submission mode um, because since Flink 1.5 it's also possible to, to submit um, SQL queries using a SQL CLI client. Um, you can either use the SQL client for some interactive queries or also for um, running a detached query to Flink. So you submit the query to Flink and then um, yeah, then Flink does the, the whole work for you so you can shut down the SQL CLI client. So I quickly want to show you the SQL client. Um, this is how it looks like. Um, I will also show you a demo uh, shortly. Um, what is the goal of the SQL client? Goal is controlling Flink, submitting your queries without a single line of code. You define some properties in YAML and you can drag and drop your SQL jars for connectors and formats into the SQL client and then you can either, either use the SQL client for prototyping or for submission. So this is how a regular YAML format looks like. So you define the schema of the table, the sources like Kafka or, or Elasticsearch and so on, and then you're done basically. And this is how the architecture of the SQL client uh, looks like. So you're submitting your query via the CLI, and then there is a gateway that um, optimizes everything, knows about all available tables, and then submits the job to Flink. Then Flink runs the query, and for playing around with Flink, it's possible to stream back the results from the Flink cluster to the gateway, and then uh, through the CLI back to the user. Um, but there is also, uh, as I said, a way of, uh, you can define um, your target table basically using an insert into statement in SQL. So um, you submit the query, and then the gateway takes care of submitting it to Flink. Then the Flink job runs and um, all the, the information you get is like where, where has the job been submitted to, so what is the cluster and the job ID, and then you can um, go to the, uh, the web UI of Flink and monitor your job there so you can shut down the SQL client. Um, yeah, and that's basically it. So um, yeah, specifying an insert into, uh, to, to specify the, the, the target, specifying your query, connect maybe Kafka and Elasticsearch and uh, yeah, your dashboard is basically ready. And this is also what I want to show you now. Um, by the way, um, because we are also running out of time at some point, um, I won't show you um, all the possibilities with SQL Client and Flink SQL, but if you are interested in, in, in this whole SQL area, we just um, created a SQL training that is available um, publicly, so you can have like a little tutorial how to get started. We provide a ready to use Docker comp container that already um, has Kafka and Elasticsearch included. So you can just start this Docker container and you have your running Flink instance to play around with, with um, Flink SQL. So I will start the, the Docker comp container. I hope everything works with the, with the projector. Far we cannot see much. Great. Okay, so I will start the SQL client. In the background, there is some Python script that inserts records a little bit slowly into Kafka, and then we are reading from Kafka. So you, we can first show all the tables we have right now. So there is a taxi rides table, and there are also um, some things. So the taxi rides is using the, the New York City taxi ride data set. Uh, we can quickly describe the schema of this taxi rides. Um, yeah, as you can see, we have uh, events coming in describing a taxi start and a taxi end event. And yeah, you can do some computation on this, on this taxi ride data set. So I mean, the first and um, most easiest thing is just, uh, why not just printing um, the, 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 the data um, on the console. Um, yeah, as you can see, here's the data, it's coming in. Um, so we are submitting a, a Flink job to the cluster. Um, yeah, we can also um, reduce the, the refresh interval. So now we can um, 
look at our data, we can select rows, we can open a row, have a look in, into our, our data, and yeah, so you can go through your data if you want. Um, yeah, why not also performing some more batch-like computation um, with uh, some statistics? Let's calculate maybe the average amount of passengers that a taxi usually uh, um, transports. Um, and since we are doing this in a streaming fashion, we get into, uh, immediately results. Like as you can see, we already processed 7,000 taxi rides. Um, and interestingly, the, the average amount of passengers per taxi is um, always one. Uh, not very spectac spectacular, but at least now we know, okay, maybe we don't have to um, pass our entire, entire data for computation because apparently uh, it already converged to one, so we can already um, cancel uh, this query at this point. Um, yeah, let's do some, some more complicated stuff. I hope the Beamer works. Yeah. So this is a SQL query that uses um, the built-in window functions that we provide in Flink. Um, here we just want to identify very popular pickup and drop-off locations in New York City. So what we are doing with this query is basically we compute every five minutes for each area the number of departing and arriving taxis. So what we do is we are grouping um, by the area ID and by the is start event, and then we are defining a window um, of five minutes, and then we do some computation, so we are counting here, and um, yeah, we also wanna have the end timestamp um, of this window. I can also show it quickly on the CLI. As you can see, it's running um, and we are getting our counts. And these counts can then be stored in Kafka again because it does not contain any updates. Um, whenever a window is computed, this is uh, insert only operation so we can uh, dump it into Kafka, for example. We can also do more complicated, even more complicated stuff like, um, yeah, why not computing the average ride duration per pickup location? So what we are basically doing in this query, we have two subqueries. So, uh, subquery one gives us uh, the start events. Subquery two gives us the end events that are coming in from the taxi. So we are joining these two events together um, in order to bound the state size. Um, we are using a window join here, so we are defining um, a time constraint um, when these two start and end events should meet, meet each other. So here we say, okay, they should meet it, each other within one hour. That is regularly more than enough for us. Um, yeah, and then we can group by maybe some, some area ID and um, compute um, the average here. And we are doing some transformation to, to convert it into minutes. Uh, in this example. Yeah, and, oh, sorry, I have to leave the mode. Yeah, and if you just want to, um, maybe you have some computation and now you want to just dump it into Elasticsearch, we can also do that. So let's just take a very simple query. So we, it's a simple um, um, count per area ID. Um, yeah, let's look into our elastic search so far. Um, as you can see, um, there is an index not found exception, um, so the index has not been created. But once we submit our query and say we want to insert it into a predefined elastic search sync, once we submit this to the cluster, um, we can also monitor it in Flink. So here you can see there is a running Flink job that executes our, our pipeline. And if we go into Elasticsearch, we can also see that now um, we have a streaming um, pipeline and this count is, is updated from time to time, or it should at least update itself. I don't know why it's, ah, yeah. So as you can see, the, the count is increasing whenever I refresh, um, so our pipeline um, yeah, it's ready to use, so you just connect it with some visualization tool, and then basically um, you're done. So
So as a summary, um, this whole unification of batch and streaming is important because it it, 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 it makes um, architectures easier and it also allows you to have the same logic for both uh, types of queries, so for both uh, historical queries and also for future running, long running um, queries. Um, Flink SQL already solves many, many uh, streaming and batch use cases and we are still improving and improving to make the, the whole thing even more useful. It's already proven at scale um, at Alibaba, at Uber, also Huawei is using Flink SQL in their cloud offering. Um, right now you can deploy your queries either as an entire Flink application that is packaged into a jar and submitted to the cluster. You can also use the CLI and we will also, uh, we are also thinking about providing things like a REST API so that you can just submit the SQL query via REST to the SQL client um, yeah, and then control Flink from this REST API um, via SQL. Um, but for now I would just invite you to join the discussions because it's an open source project and we're also very happy about feedback, how we can improve what is missing in, in Flink SQL. So if you have any um, valuable information for us or just want to open a bug um, report then do that. Uh, we are very happy about that. Um, if you want to know more about Flink um, there is also there are two books, so one book that is covering the basics of Flink and there is also a very good and entire book um, in the making that covers everything, so from, de from deployment over API considerations and so on. Um, it's not done yet but uh, some chapters are already available on O'Reilly early release if you're interested uh, into um, Apache Flink. And yeah, as always we are hiring so if you want to work with people on interesting uh, streaming stuff feel free to reach out to me otherwise I'm waiting for you in the office hour um, after this talk. Thank you very much. So uh, what kind of use cases would you say are more favorable for Flink SQL over for example Spark SQL? Um, variety of use cases I would say like um, if you want to do like simple ETL this is very useful especially if you just want to map data from one format to the other format very useful um, job um, and as I said like powering dashboards like um, yeah if you have multiple dashboards for different people and you just want to specify this dashboard as one SQL query that you can manage and I mean a SQL query is very easily manageable because it won't change in the next 20 years I think because it hasn't changed for the last 40 years so um, yeah that's that's one of the use cases whenever you want to have a pipeline um, um, quickly entered by somebody else maybe that is not familiar with Java and Scala.